First of all, well done, congratulations. What a great year. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> so this is, this is the fourth year that I've done this, and um, one thing that I think I've learned that the faculty knew uh, before, before I did is, because this is a graduate school and it's a very intensive one-year program, it's kind of strange compared to colleges or other long-term uh, university programs because you all come and go as a group, by and large. Of course, there are some part-time students and some PhD students who stay. But the result is it's such an intense program, right? You come in very excited, then the days get darker and shorter and colder, and the pressure builds and it builds, and the thesis is around the horizon. And in February, you know, it feels like we're gonna have a collective nervous breakdown. And then slowly the days get longer and a little warmer and the thesis is done. And then you have this weird euphoria that takes over in about April uh, and, and carries everyone through. But in the midst of that, this kind of collective experience, each class has its own character. Uh, and now I've known four of them. Uh, not all of that character is sound, uh, I would say. Uh, <laughs> But this, I honestly think, is the best class that I've known. Uh, you've taken care of each other, you've supported each other, you've really done your work seriously. It's been a strong class, and, and I think a really mutually supportive class. You really, des I think on behalf of all the faculty, thank you for being uh, such a supportive class. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I wonder a little bit if that's not an, if that's, uh, if there's a reason, apart from your fine character, which is what happened this year to journalism and to those of you who are going into it. I mean, I, I, I think many of us recall vividly that, that Wednesday in November where some of us got together in the Stabile Center to talk about where we go from here, uh, the anxiety of our international students, uh, some from countries like Syria who wondered if they could go home for winter break or what was gonna happen to them when they crossed the border, the question of how you go out and report in an environment like this inside your identity when you're being uh, uh, yelled at and spit at, at at public rallies and public events. And just kind of working through that, I remember the faculty who turned up that day and what Jelani had to say, Jelani Cobb, about the nature of struggle in an open society. These rights never come easy, they never come in a straight line, and we all have a role to play. And from there, I remember Ari Goldman, who turned up our faculty colleague, who mentioned that he had been in the class of uh, 1973 and uh, in November 1972, he had also been surprised that uh, President Nixon had won 49 out of 50 states. And then he took note uh, in the summer of 1974 that uh, the president resigned because of the work of a couple of kid reporters at the Washington Post. And so that's a pretty good transition to our speaker this morning. <laughs> um, so David Farenthold, um, I, I was fortunate to be uh, the ME at the Post when David came. I, I can't um, claim any credit for his arrival, but I, I will from here on out. Um, anyway, uh, he came as, a, he really followed the hardcore uh, Washington Post, New York Times, Miami Herald path. He came in as a summer intern. Uh, we used to have the resources and the stability in those days to invite a class in every summer, and it was sort of a tryout to see who would stick and uh, David was one who came in that summer onto the city desk in DC and he stuck. And his first job was night cops. And after that, he did day cops. <laughs> uh, and uh, after that, he, he, um, he did some local environmental reporting, some really strong in, uh, enterprise reporting that I, I remember still about the Chesapeake watershed and how it was polluted. And then uh, eventually he uh, came onto the national staff and uh, was doing environmental reporting until he switched to politics in 2010. Uh, one thing I know about David, having been his colleague for, for five years and then still having so many friends in that newsroom, is that uh, it's very rare for someone to be as great as David is and also to be really well liked. <laughs> and David is really well liked, which is, to my mind, as much of an achievement as his uh, work this year. So he's pretty much swept the field this year for his reporting on um, the president's charitable giving or the gaps in between what the president said and what the president did, his methodology, his use of social media to track down uh, leads, his persistence, his good cheer, the fact that he also broke the Access Hollywood tape uh, story, which at the time he broke it, 
shattered the Post's uh, online traffic record, which had previously been held by a, a story about a woman in Burundi who had faked her own death, death and then turned up at her funeral to frighten people. <laughs> so, uh, so, so the Access Hollywood tape had a slightly grander public purpose, uh, even if it maybe didn't have the impact that uh, we all thought it would in the end, politically, but uh, a fabulous and important piece of journalism. And then uh, David was telling me that last night his record was broken by the Washington Post's uh, Russia in the Oval Office story. So that's a pretty good story to yield to. Um, so enough for me. Please welcome David Ferenthold. Well, thank you, Steve, and thank you, everybody, for having me here. It's, it's such an honor to be here in a place that has, cre has uh, graduated so many wonderful journalists and is about to graduate such wonderful journalists. I'm, I'm really humbled and honored to be here with you. Uh, I wanted just to start by telling you a story about one of uh, Columbia's uh, proudest graduates um, who we lost recently, Wayne Barrett, uh, class of 1968, who was uh, the longtime famous muckraker at the Village Voice. Um, I talked to him last year. And I, I just want to tell you this story briefly because it sort of encapsulates uh, what a wonderful example he is. So in the middle of my coverage of the Donald J. Trump Foundation, this charity that Trump had started and was mostly filled with other people's money, um, I ran across a mystery that I couldn't solve. In the 1990s, the two biggest donations from the Trump Foundation in that decade were to this weird museum, the National Catholic Museum of Art and History, which was located in a former mafia clubhouse in East Harlem. And I, I couldn't make sense of it. Um, Trump is not Catholic. He doesn't care much about history, certainly not into art, unless it's art of himself. Uh, and uh, it seemed at the time th that this might be true philanthropy. It might break sort of a pattern that I had seen, which is that Trump often would give of his charity to help himself, to, to, to give to people who could help him. I, I couldn't figure out the mystery until I realized that Wayne Barrett had solved the mystery in 2001. Um, he had gone to the museum at that time uh, and had discovered that it contained not that much art. Uh, one picture of the Pope and some nun dolls that had been bought on the Home Shopping Network. Um, it was mostly a well-appointed home for the woman who was the director of the museum, including a jacuzzi with solid gold fittings. Um, and he discovered that that woman was a very, very good friend of a leader in the labor union, a big labor union in New York. And that guy was a very, very good friend of Donald Trump in that he provided labor union pension funding to some of Trump's real estate projects. So I called Wayne. Uh, 15 years later, he remembered it perfectly. I'm going to quote from the interview. It was a scam from beginning to end, he said. But it was a scam run by people who had a great deal of clout, so people gave. So it was not the exception to the rule of Donald Trump's giving. It was the rule. Uh, I would never have known that if it hadn't been for Wayne Barron. He died uh, January 19th of this year, the day before Inauguration Day. So I think we can honor him, honor his life by taking up his work. Um, there's a quote that uh, I read in his obituary that really stuck with me. He said, there is no other job where you get paid to tell the truth. So I'm into that. Um, so I wanted to just tell you a little bit about my experience covering candidate Trump last year, President Trump this year, and maybe offer a few lessons about what it means to, come to be a journalist at this time, which is so vital, uh, but also so overwhelming, exhausting, all those things. Uh, journalism, you're about to enter journalism at a time when it has enormous power, um, unusual, an unusual amount of power and influence and trust, in part because the nat national institutions uh, that we cover are sort of weakening and declining in trust. Um, so you guys will step out of here and step right into a time uh, when American history is going to look back and judge American journalism. When, gonna, it's going to look back on this as sort of one of our most important times. So uh, we better be ready. So Steve told you a little bit of my, about my career at The Post. Uh, I actually started covering the 2016 campaign, God help me, back in December of 2014. Uh, and the first few weeks and months of that really should not be spoken of at great length. They didn't amount to very much. Just to give you a sense of what I was doing during that time, I spent three weeks on a profile of Bobby Jindal. Um, <laughs> so that the first lesson of today will be for anyone who is uh, thinking about going into political journalism, if you're thinking about profiling a, a presidential candidate, you should look in the polls and see, look for the number next to that <laughs> candidate you're about to profile's name. And if that number is not actually a number, but maybe an asterisk or a less than one or the word undetectable, 
just don't do it. Learn, <laughs> learn from my example, just don't do it. Um, in February 12, 2016, though, I got onto this story almost by accident about Donald Trump. Trump had said uh, in January of 2016 that he was going to get, he, he was in a feud with Fox News. If that sounds believable now, he was in a feud with Fox News, and he skipped a Fox News run presidential debate to have his own fundraiser, sort of counter programmed the Fox News debate by having a fundraiser on television in Iowa. And he said at the time that he'd raised $6 million that he was going to give to veterans, including a million dollars that was going to come straight out of his own pocket. So the question I asked in February of 2016, a few weeks later, was, where did the money go? Who got the money? And I thought at the time this would be a simple story, sort of a two-day story. I'd ask the question, they'd give me the answers. We move on. Um, one of the things about me that I've discovered is that I'm an optimist. I'm somebody who sort of sees the best in everyone and wants to believe the best about everybody, which means that as a journalist, I'm constantly being surprised. Uh, <laughs> things are always sneaking up on me. Uh, and that was the case here. Uh, I couldn't get an answer from the Trump campaign, not in a week or a month, or not in two months. It got to be May, and I still couldn't figure out where half of that money had gone, $3 million out of the $6 million, including the one, and part of the missing money, part of the missing $3 million was the $1 million that Trump said he was going to give out of his own pocket. I couldn't find it. And then one day, Corey Lewandowski, who was Trump's campaign manager at the time, called me. And he said, um, OK, I can tell you something here. I can tell you for sure Donald Trump has given away the $1 million he said he would give to veterans. But I can't tell you who got it, or when, or in what amounts. It's all secret. Just trust me, the money's been given away. So uh, I hope we're at the end of a year of Columbia Journalism School instruction. Hopefully, you guys are with me in this, that you can't just trust somebody like that, right? You can't take their word for it, especially when the candidate had made such a big deal of his love for veterans and his, his, his desire to help veterans. So, I want to try to check this. I want to find some way of figuring out if Trump really did this. Uh, but how? I felt like I had gone, gone to the end of what all my journalism training had taught me. I'd called the Trump campaign. They wouldn't tell me, obviously. I'd called all the veterans' charities that had been listed as recipients of the money in the past. They didn't have this money. Um, I had called veterans' advisors to the Trump campaign. I'd called everyone that I thought might know uh, what had happened to this million dollars that supposedly Trump had given to veterans, and I, I couldn't figure it out. So in desperation, I decided to open up my reporting, to let people see what I was doing in the hopes that they might be able to help. So I spent this day on Twitter sending out Twitter requests to all these veterans organizations, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, the VFW, the American Legion, and saying, have you gotten even one dollar of this million dollars Donald Trump said he was going to give away? And I included Trump's handle, at real Donald Trump, in every one of the questions because I thought, I knew Trump spends a lot of time searching for his own name on Twitter uh, and that he would see it. And it, maybe he would come forward and tell me or maybe one of these charities would come forward and tell me. So I spent a day doing that and I learned nothing. Uh, all the charities that I had contact with said they had not gotten any money from Trump. I had, I had spent all this time and had not found one dollar of the million dollars Donald Trump said he'd given away. It turned out that was because the million dollars did not exist. Uh, Trump had not given that money away. It was only that night after I'd spent the day searching in public for this money that Donald Trump actually gave the million dollars away. Um, he gave it all in one fell swoop to a, a, a charity run by a friend of his who was a former FBI agent. Um, so Trump called me the next day to tell me, uh, it's actually this is the last time we talked, uh, <laughs> he called me to say that he'd given the money away. Um, and I said, well, you know, why did it take you so long? Why did it take you four months to give this money away? And he said, well, I had to, I had to vet the group that I was giving the money to. It happened that I knew the group that he gave the money to had held an award ceremony for him the year before at the Waldorf Astoria in New York, where they all dressed up in black tie and named Donald Trump the man of the year. And I said, after that, you had to vet this group? You had to, you had to find out more information? He sort of said, yeah, yeah, that's true. And then I said, well, did you just give this money away now because I was asking about it? If I, you know, if I hadn't asked for this, if I hadn't been searching for this money, would you ever have given it away? That is when he called me a nasty guy uh, <laughs> and didn't answer the question. Um, So th there's three big lessons I took away from last year. This is the first lesson. Do what you can to make your work transparent, to show people what you're doing, what you know, what you don't know, what you're still trying to know. Um, that's important as we try to build trust in an era when we're being called fake news. It's important to show people how we, how we do what we do, to give them an idea of how, how we know what we know, how we can report the things that we're reporting. Um, also, though, there's an, another aspect to it that I hadn't really even anticipated at the beginning, which is that it, 
by opening up your reporting, it allows you to tap into the knowledge and the expertise and the ideas of all these readers out there who that you think you may think of yourselves and you should think of yourselves now as well-trained journalists, great investigators, people who know how to find things. I did too, but there's all kinds of things you don't know because your life experience hasn't taught you them. And it, by opening up my reporting in this way, I found readers who knew things and knew how to find things that I just didn't know. The best example here, a portrait. A portrait of Donald Trump. At one point during this reporting, we find out that Donald Trump has, has used money from his charity, the Donald J. Trump Foundation, he spent $10,000 to buy a large portrait of himself. Um, now, one of the most basic laws of charity law in the United States is that you can't use money in your charity to buy things for yourself or to buy things to decorate your business. So I needed to know where this portrait was. Had, if the Trump Foundation had bought it, it needed, to, it needed to be used for a charitable purpose. So maybe it's hanging on the wall of a children's hospital someplace. Maybe it's, you know, there's some sort of charity out there that wanted this. I need to find it. And the Trump people, of course, wouldn't tell me. Um, so I put it out on Twitter. I said, look, here's a picture of this portrait I'm looking for. I need to know where in the world it is. And um, that was like at 10 a.m. one day. That afternoon, I have a, a, a Twitter follower, a reader named Allison Aguilar, who lives in Atlanta. I've never met her. She's a short story writer. I'll probably never meet her. She looks at this portrait, and she has two thoughts that had not occurred to me. One, it's too ugly for Trump to put it in his own house. He's going to have to put it somewhere where the public has to look at it. Two, uh, the, the place to look for it would be TripAdvisor. Um, the, you know, you guys have all you've seen this site where you go to the TripAdvisor, and people can put in user-generated photos of whatever the thing that they've, you know, whatever they're rating. Uh, and so she goes to the TripAdvisor page for Trump's golf course at Doral, outside Miami. And uh, there's 500 user-generated photos there. I mean, I, I, I can't put myself in the shoes of a person who would take a picture of their hotel buffet and upload it to, to the, the, the internet. But people did that. There's, all, there's multiple shots of the buffet. Um, there's the 18th green. There's the hotel bathrooms. All kinds of things that people had put in there to show what, the, what Doral looked like. She scrolls through them, 350 photos down. She finds a picture of the portrait I'm looking for hanging on the wall of the sports bar with some guy next to it. Um, <laughs> And so she, so that the photo was dated February 2016. Okay, so now we know where the photo was. We didn't know if it's still there. So I, again, put it out on Twitter. Um, that's like, this is like 6.30 or, six, or 7 o'clock that night. Uh, a guy named Enrique Acevedo, who is an a anchor at Univision, the Spanish language TV network down in Miami, sees the tweet. He realizes that's four blocks away. Doral and Univision studi studios are separated by four blocks. He makes a reservation for that night. <laughs> He uses, he uses points. He doesn't give, want to give Donald Trump his money, so he uses Amex points. Uh, so he, his newscast ends at midnight. He gets off. He goes to the hotel, checks in, convinces the cleaning crew to let him into the sports bar. And there it is, hanging on the wall, um, breaking the law. Uh, we, so we've gone from 10 a.m. that morning not knowing where in the world this portrait was and me trying to think of, like, can I send freelancers? How am I going to get into all these Trump properties to look for it? 14 hours later, we have a picture of it on the wall. Uh, breaking the law. That was sort of thing that would have been impossible uh, five years ago, and it would have been impossible to me if I hadn't sort of opened up the process. So uh, that was a huge lesson for me in the power of letting people in to see what you're doing. So as the year went on, we tried to expand that approach. I um, got a legal pad, and we started searching for evidence that Donald Trump had been making good on other charitable promises from years before. He'd spent years promising to give away the proceeds of the Celebrity Apprentice, the proceeds of Trump University. He once rented a tent to Muammar Gaddafi, and he wanted he was going to give the proceeds away of that. All these promises to give money to veterans. I'm sorry, to charity, to charity generally. And uh, at one point, my editor, uh, Marty Barron, said, well, why don't we look and see whether he's been making good on those promises? Basically, if the charity, the veterans example has shown us that Donald Trump was willing to try to wiggle out of a commitment to veterans under the brightest spotlight we have in American journalism, which is a presidential campaign. If he was willing to do that, what was he willing to do before when you know, the only people around to check his promises were like entertainment tonight? Uh, so we've been looking. I started calling all the charities that, that I thought were closest to Trump, the charities that had rented rooms at Mar-a-Lago, the charities he'd praised on Twitter, and, and seeing if they had ever gotten any of the money Trump had promised to give away. And I kept track of it on a, note, on a notepad. I got, eventually got to 450 charities. Along the way, I discovered all kinds of things I, I didn't really think I was looking for, like um, Donald Trump's 
charity, the Donald J. Trump Foundation, had not only bought portraits of him uh, for a total of $30,000, it had used its money to settle the legal bills of Donald Trump's for-profit businesses. It had given a $25,000 donation to a campaign fund for Pam Bondi, the Attorney General in Florida, at the same time that her office was considering whether to join a lawsuit against Trump University. We discovered all these things. With, uh, the Attorney General of New York started an investigation into the Trump Foundation that continues today. Um, I felt like we told people a lot about Donald Trump's character and sort of the way he viewed charity, um, which was uh, certainly he realized that he needed to, be, to appear charitable, but that he, if he could get away with it, he would, he would avoid sort of the substance of charity, which, as I said, giving of himself to help others. Instead, often he would try to give of other people to help himself. Um, and along the way, uh, in October of uh, uh, last year, we got this video, the Access Hollywood video, Donald Trump talking about in 2005, talking about his ability to grope women and uh, saying, if you're a star, they'll let you get away with it. That, as Steve said, until yesterday, was the most viewed story in, in the history of the Washington Post. Uh, so and at, at the time, it seemed like that might, for a while, it seemed like that might be something that sw swung the election. And in that moment, uh, you know, a couple of weeks after the Access Hollywood tape, when it seemed like that was going to be the most consequential story of this election, I was interviewed by a, a German reporter. Um, I don't know if there's German reporters here in the audience, but they have a sort of a certain dourness to their interviewing quality. <laughs> and uh, the question he asked was, um, this is a time when I'm, I'm, you know, feeling good about the work that I did. He said, do you think this was the peak of your life? <laughs> uh, okay, so remember that. Fast forward three weeks. Um, Trump wins the, the, you know, a lot of things happen. The Comey letter comes out. Donald Trump wins the election. Uh, a few days later, I'm interviewed by a, another German reporter who, um, who said, do you think that maybe none of it mattered at all? <laughs> so the second, <laughs> the answer to both questions was no. Uh, the, that's the second lesson I want to bring here, which is, don't listen to people who say nothing matters or think that the lesson of Donald Trump and journalism is that nothing matters. Uh, it's not, certainly not the lesson of the campaign. The reporting we and other people did about Donald Trump painted this incredibly vivid picture of him and I thought got behind and showed the, the real character of a man who had spent a life constructing a facade um, to show the public about himself. That was valuable work. We did our job, which was to inform the voters before they made their decision. They did their job, they voted. Now our job goes on, and there's, and there's no reason now to think that because Donald Trump's, you know, that you'll see arguments that because the House, the House Republicans or the Senate Republicans haven't turned on him because his base is still with him, that's some reason not to keep writing about him. That's not the point. That's not the reason we do it, okay? Uh, and it's, it's certainly a misreading of history. Uh, even, if you're, even if you think that the goal is to, to well, just as one example, everybody remembers, hopefully everyone remembers, the last scene of All the President's Men. Um, where Ben Bradley is talking to Woodward and Bernstein in his, in his driveway, and he says, have you seen the late, latest Gallup poll? Half the country's never even heard of Watergate, okay? The lesson there was not, so don't write about Watergate. The lesson was not, LOL, nothing matters. It was, keep writing about this. This is what mattered. The con this is a hugely vital, important subject for the country, even if part of the country doesn't realize it yet. So I think that's the thing to keep in mind. Uh, the idea that nothing matters, that the lesson of Trump is nothing matters, could not be farther from the truth. Um, but we do have to keep in mind one thing about the way our readers experience news, okay? The mental image I had when I started in, in this business in the 1990s was, you know, who is your consu the consumer of your news? It's a person sitting down with their breakfast cereal reading the newspaper. In the 2000s, we imagined somebody sitting down at their desk with a cup of coffee, starting the day, not actually doing their work, reading the newspaper online. Uh, now, you know, the sort of people who are ready to sort of sit down and learn and read something very deep about a particular subject. Now, my mental image of a Washington Post news consumer is someone who's been spat out of a tornado. Uh, you know, if you encounter someone who's been spat out of a tornado, they're confused, they're covered in hay and other sorts of things. They need, a, they're disoriented. Our readers are, are, are struck by a sort of constant tornado of news from a variety of sources. Uh, things that happened this morning seem old by the end of the day. What we need to remember is not nothing matters, but rather that those folks need a thread. We need to think about our coverage in a way that gives people a thread to follow and a thread to pick up again when they've lost it. Um, that was, for me, that was the notebook last year. And I'm, if you were 
following all the different twists and turns of that campaign and you come back to Twitter and you see, oh yeah, there's the guy with a notebook. I know what he's about. I can pick up that thread. Um, and we did that. We, we created a landing page so that if you're interested in me, in what I'm doing, you can go to that page and catch up instantly to what we're doing. So I think that should affect a couple of things. It should affect the way investigative reporting is done, not as one big giant uh, dump of news or a three-part series of 100-inch stories, but rather a, I think it works better if you do these stories iter iteratively, one drip at a time. It draws people's attention. It helps you learn more as you inform people about what you're doing. Uh, and it re meets readers where they are, which is they're not going to be able to sit down and, and read one long story and, and then have their mind changed. Um, so I think that's something we have to think about as we, as we write stories, as we, as we think about creating content, as we think about designing and, uh, and distributing our news, is how to remember that people are sort of lost in this tornado and want to give them a thread to follow and a thread to pick up. The last thing I want to do is talk about um, sort of a broader lesson about the idea that the media is the enemy of the people, the, the, the idea that we're at war, that, the, that we and the administration or we and wh whatever politician are at war with each other. It's a very dangerous idea but for us because in war is a time that you break the rules. War is a time that you bend the rules. War is an excuse to bend the rules. And this is a time when we have to remember that our credibility, our accuracy, our restraint, our caution are the things that got us here and got us the unusual amount of influence and power we have. Um, we can't give them up because we absorb the idea that we're in a war with somebody and we have to win. Um, so the, the power that we have now, the influence that we have now requires this, us to show even more of the restraint and attention to detail and accuracy that, we, that has gotten us the, the influence we have right now. So uh, Marty Barron, our executive editor, has said this line, and I'm just going to steal it now because I think it's the best summation of where journalism needs to be. Uh, you know, we're not at war, we're at work. And the best thing for us to do is to show people as much as we can about how we do that work so they trust it and so also, that, also so they can try to help us do it. Um, with that, uh, thank you for inviting me here. <laughs> Except in my own applause line, I, I want to just leave you guys with the words of Wayne Barrett. We're in the only, you're entering the only job in the world where you get paid to tell the truth. So God bless you. Congratulations. Thank you, David, for, for honoring us with your presence and with those uh, remarks. I should have mentioned that uh, David was invited by uh, the annual vote of the faculty for the journalist that most exemplifies in the year past uh, the values that we're trying to teach and promote. And so this Pringle lecture is a, a very raucous, open uh, caucus vote of the full-time faculty. And uh, in this, this case, it wasn't, it wasn't close or contentious. So um, thanks to the Pringle family for making this possible. We have two other professional awards, and then we'll uh, turn to student awards. And uh, to prevent the, present the first of those, I'd like to invite Professor Paula Spann to present the Mike Berger Award. That was the most fun Pringle lecture since Molly Ivins. <laughs> and, and that is high praise. Um, Meyer Berger, known as Mike, was a grade school dropout who became a messenger boy, a copy boy, and then for 30 years, a beloved and respected reporter and columnist for the New York Times. He was best known for meticulously detailed portraits of the places and inhabitants of New York, which he once called the city of 10,000 anomalies. He's remembered in particular for the story that won him the Pulitzer Prize in 1950 about a deranged man shooting rampage that took the life of 13 people in Camden, New Jersey. Assigned to the story at about 11 AM, Mike Berger hopped the first train to Camden, interviewed 50 people, and in the days before cell phones or laptops, filed his flawless 4,000-word story an hour before deadline at 9.20 PM. He essentially wrote a master's project in eight hours. 
This award, established to celebrate his career, honors outstanding human interest reporting. This year, the judges, uh, Professors Dale Maharaj and David Haydu and I, read through 80 entries. And that process gave us two things. First, significant eye strain and <laughs> renewed optimism about the state of American journalism. We read extraordinary work. It was a banner year. And it came from big media organizations and small ones, newspapers, magazines, web-only publications that none of us had ever heard of until two years ago, venerable papers founded in the 1800s, nonprofits that didn't exist until 2014. One finalist was a podcast. Another was a 40,000-word piece that took over the entire issue of the New York Times Magazine. And I'm happy to say that women were heavily represented. And from all of this, we chose to give the award to Eli Saslow of the Washington Post. And this was our explanation. In 2016, Washington Post staff writer Eli Saslow covered the America given short shrift by much of the national press during the election year. With deep and intimate reporting in five stories, Saslow illuminates the struggle, the rage, and the despair among once middle class whites many of whom voted for Donald Trump. Saslow was there for the funeral of a woman in Oklahoma who drank herself to death at the age of 54, putting a face on statistics about an increasing death rate for whites. He took readers into a pocket of West Virginia where three children lost their parents to opioids. In Indiana, Saslow documented the unraveling of a town through the story of one family devastated by a corporation's decision to ship jobs to Mexico. His stories, as Post editor Martin Barron wrote in his nominating letter, were empathetic without being exculpatory. Saslow is a first-rate reporter with an exacting eye for detail. His work exemplifies the ideals of Mike Berger, shoe leather journalism that reveals and revels in the complexities of the human condition and with prose that is original, insightful, even poetic. We are, to use the technical term, deeply bummed that Eli Saslow wasn't able to be here today. <laughs> but he asked me to tell you this, and I'm quoting from him. For me, the joy of this work last year and every year is earning the trust of the people I write about and getting to spend time in all these diverse corners of the country. At a time when we are increasingly divided and siloed, it is such an awesome privilege to write about people's lives with intimacy and empathy so that hopefully readers might understand them better. I'm very grateful for the award and the recognition and also so pleased to be associated in any way with the Berger family. I so wish I could be there. Well, we wish that he could too. But his stories are on the J School website. And Mike Berger's story about Camden is on the Pulitzer Prizes website, and I commend them both to your attention. Thank you, Paula. We have one more professional award to present, and that's the Paul Tabenkin Memorial Award, and Professor Keith Gesson will tell you about it and bring the winner up. Uh, the Paul Tabankin Memorial Award is awarded each year to honor the late New York Herald Tribune reporter Paul Tabankin. Um, it recognizes outstanding achievements in reporting on racial and religious hatred, intolerance, or discrimination in the United States. Um, it was set up by Paul Tabankin's father, Elias Tabankin, um, who was also a journalist, um, and uh, was a father-son duo of journalists. Uh, Paul Tabenkin died in his middle age, and Elias Tabenkin set this up in uh, the late 1950s at the height of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, the winner of the Tabenkin Award receives a $1,500 honorarium. Um, the judges for this award, uh, Professors Yelena Cabral, uh, Jelani Cobb, and myself, um, we found it a a pretty depressing experience uh, reading for this award. Um, it was a banner year for journalism 2016, 
Um, it was also a banner year for uh, religious and racial discrimination. Um, we found, um, you know, reading the entries, it was pretty much like everywhere you looked, um, there was uh, there was this stuff going on. Um, whether it was uh, universities, um, whether it was the rise of white nationalism in the shadow of the Trump uh, the Trump campaign at the time. Um, whether it was persistent racial bias at all levels of the criminal justice system. Uh, there were many strong entries. Um, if there was a silver lining to 2016 um, in regard to the Dibenkin Award, it was the number of very strong entries. Um, the fact that this stuff that's going on is being reported on um, and is not going unnoticed uh, was the kind of bright spot in, in reading for this award. Uh, in the end, we decided to give a special citation um, and the award itself. The special citation goes to Will Evans of Reveal and the Center for Investigative Reporting for a series of reports about uh, the ways in which temp agencies um, are asked to discriminate against applicants uh, by employers. Essentially, the employers outsource the discrimination uh, to the temp agencies using various code words. Um, and uh, the worst part about it is that the, the applicants uh, never know. They never know that they're being discriminated against. Um, this series of articles prompted an investigation by the, um, by the, the government, which is still ongoing. The winner of this year's Tobankin Award is Jenny Monet for her reporting on the resistance of the Stanley Rock Sioux Tribe to the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Monet began going to North Dakota last September and embedded herself with the water protectors in December during a very cold winter in North Dakota. She wrote with great sympathy and understanding of the long history of the Lakota Sioux, their difficult situation in North Dakota, the generations of poverty and marginalization and broken promises, and described what happened when they tried to assert their rights. Uh, what happened was what she called a months long militarized protection of a corporate energy project. In the course of her reporting, she was arrested despite clearly identifying herself as a reporter and charged with criminal trespassing and rioting, charges that are still pending. Monet did all this as an independent journalist uh, without the support of a major newsroom, publishing reporting uh, in outlets such as Yes Magazine, High Country News, Indian Country Media, uh, and Reveal. Um, Jenny Monet is a founder and uh, the host of the Still Here podcast. She is also, as we learned when we had already uh, chosen her uh, for the award, she is a graduate of the MA program here at Columbia. So for her reporting on what she called one of the greatest indigenous struggles of modern times, I am very proud to be giving the Paul Tabenkin Award to Jenny Monet. Please come up. Thank you for that lovely introduction and for inviting me here back to the J School. It's so nice to be back. I'd like to extend a warm thank you to the Columbia Journalism School and to the Debankin panel of judges for this lovely special recognition. It's truly uh, humbling and I am so grateful for the support. When I made my first trip to Standing Rock last fall, I had actually left New York and moved to Tucson to teach journalism and to launch that podcast that you mentioned. And a former student, this very charismatic Navajo woman, had uh, crossed paths with me and we had been talking about Standing Rock and then a few days later, I get this very random and cryptic text message that was something to the effect of, um, I rented a van, we roll out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and I did not know this woman that well. I think I had maybe one encounter. I, she was not even plugged into my phone. So it was this very bizarre message. 
But it did not take long for me to understand what that message meant because at that time in mid-August leading up to Labor Day weekend, Standing Rock was the only thing that people were talking about in Indian country. And so it had been discussed before that we would join the hundreds of other native people across the country who were hopping in cars and road tripping up to the ancestral treaty territory of the Great Sioux Nation. And that's exactly what we did. We packed up that van and six months later, it led to the consecutive reporting project of uh, exactly what I have described as one of the greatest indigenous moments in our modern time. On that inaugural trip, we arrived just as private security guards hired by the Dakota Access Pipeline Company had used attack dogs and pepper spray on water protectors or protesters. The activists scaled a thin barbed wire fence to try to stop the scraping of the land that the Lakota Sioux in court documents had declared as sacred just days earlier. At least six protesters were bitten by those dogs that day and the drama was captured in a video that went viral by Democracy Now. It galvanized the movement at Standing Rock, and as I wrote in my first dispatch from the reservation, it drew an alarming first look at the companies behind the pipeline project and the military-style tactics that they would use to advance it. The policing only intensified as the resistance campaign against the $3.8 billion energy project grew. At its height, Officers from multiple states, the North Dakota National Guard, and hired security detail from the energy companies themselves had amassed a small army equipped with rubber-coated bullets, canisters of tear gas, armored vehicles, MRAP tanks, water cannons. There was also the low-flying aircraft leased to Dakota Access and flown by local police officers that circled the skies in constant surveillance of the water protectors and intense guarding of the pipeline construction project. Washday Wee Young, a Standing Rock Sioux tribal citizen and mother of four, was among the thousands of people who moved to the network of camps along the Missouri River. In fierce resolve to protect that water, the tribe's primary drinking supply, from potential contamination of an oil spill. To be sure, Young was the first to alarm the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe about the pipeline project after learning about it in a newspaper article in 2014. She was the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer back then, and she had successfully worked to bring representatives from Dakota Access to the reservation. In those talks, two years before any of this construction was to be seen taking place, Young and her mother Phyllis, who was a tribal councilwoman at the time, and the chairman of the tribe, Dave Archambault, were quite clear to Dakota Access representatives, we do not support this pipeline. That these sentiments were passed over, along with the fact that the pipeline was rerouted to Stounding Rock in order to protect water wells in Bismarck, which is a community that is predominantly white, amplifies what has long been at the heart of this indigenous struggle a consistent ignoring of treaties and the certain rights associated with this tribal autonomy, such as the right to meaningful consultation. While the legacy media was slow and often unsteady to report on these concepts at Standing Rock, this bottom-up narrative as told by the Lakota people themselves was eventually distributed by an international press representing the first time that myself and many others believe that these indigenous issues transcended beyond tribal audiences. What we saw was a collective resisting of people of all backgrounds, denouncing historic patterns of injustice linked to environmental racism, religious encroachment, and militarized control. The Dakota Access Pipeline is set, and oil will soon flow. But this is not the only struggle. Standing Rock gave renewed agency to indigenous peoples who have been the ultimate resistors for five centuries. For that, I am grateful to have been able to document this one chapter in the greater story, even if it came at the expense of my own arrest. In closing, I'd like to extend a very special thanks to Tracy Matsu Lefholtz 
editorial director of Yes Magazine, for whom nominated me for this special recognition today. And she and my colleague Mark Trahan were also early chroniclers of this movement, and they invited me to join them in those very early stages, and I am so grateful. I'd also like to thank Joaquin Alvarado and Amy Pyle at the Center for Investigative Reporting for providing me a space to write when all other journalists had left Standing Rock. They gave me a blog. And to my colleagues at PBS NewsHour, High Country News, and last but certainly not least, my family at Indian Country today. Dela A, thank you, and congratulations to all the graduates. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. And now the, uh, we, we, we're going to start with the student awards. And the first award will be presented by Tally Woodward. <coughs> um, the MA thesis prize is awarded to the best all-around thesis. The judges select a story that is built on impressive original reporting and clear thinking and that is also beautifully told. Um, the first runner-up this year wrote a unique story about art and the internet entitled Wormholes. Congratulations to Eileen Townsend. Is she here? Come on up. <laughs> Um, the second runner-up this year reported on Palestinians who moved to Syria and are now unable to leave the country. Congratulations, Riham al -Kusa. And the winner of this year's thesis prize wrote a spare and deeply reported story based on incredible access to a group of death row inmates in Tennessee who have formed an art collective. Um, congratulations, Jeremy Olds. The next award will be presented by Professor David Haydu. Congratulations, MA thesis winners. Uh, the Nona Balakian Award was established in 1992 to honor the student who shows the most promise for achievement in writing about literature. Ms. Blakian, a 1943 graduate of the Journalism School, was an editor at the New York Times Book Review and had considerable influence on American arts and letters for more than four decades. The winner this year for a series of rigorous and ele elegant elephant, elephant reviews in stature, they're elephantine. <laughs> Elegant reviews of works of contemporary fiction is Catherine Porter. Proctor. <laughs> Catherine Proctor. <laughs> Proctor. Congratulations. Um, and the next award will be presented by Professor Linnell Hancock. Hi. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, I told you this day was going to come faster than you thought. <laughs> so the late Dick Blood, my mentor and my dear friend who has the greatest name ever. <laughs> <laughs> He earns it. <laughs> he was a legendary New York City news editor and longtime reporting professor here at Columbia Journalism School. I wish you could have all known him. He both inspired and terrified generations of young journalists. And his students, despite perhaps some recurring nightmares, admired him so much that they established this award for rigorous investigative reporting in his honor. And the students do all the selecting. This year, the Richard Blood Award goes to a revealing story about the city's stop and frisk policies that have plummeted in large numbers ever since they were found unconstitutional three years ago. But the students found the reason for the drop is likely that the police are underreporting them. So stay tuned, an important story. And the winners are Inti Pacheco, <laughs> Kat Katarina Zimmer, and Iram Karakaya. And the next award will be given by Emily Bell and Mark Hansen. Hello, everyone. It's so like Eurovision. Um, we're here to. We're here to present the Tao Brown Award for Computational Journalism. Uh, our winner this year began uh, with a story that was originally uncovered by the AP about how the FBI was using low-flying aircraft for its surveillance operations. These aircraft, however, weren't directly owned by the FBI. And to hide these planes, the agency was registering them to fictitious companies and concealing them from flight tracking websites like Fra Flight Radar 24. The AP knew that dozens of these companies existed, but they never obtained a full list. Our winner set out to find that list. It involved a machine learning task to identify aircraft exhibiting telltale surveillance flight patterns, and then a careful, and then careful database work to find networks of companies owning aircraft that, you, that used to belong to the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security. It was a great piece of data-driven, computationally vibrant investigative work. I'm sorry that when I first saw it in the brown space, I actually laughed because it had an aerial. Um, uh, so we're pleased to uh, award um, this year's Tao Brown um, Award for Computational Journalism to Laurent Bastien. Vaporized by the FBI. Po possibly vaporized by the FBI, we don't know. Oh, but it's, it's pink in everything. It's pink in everything. <laughs> Mark and I will look after his money. Um, uh, and the next award will be given by Keith Goggin, a uh, graduate of 1991. I'm going to put that right there for safekeeping. Um, any of you who don't know who Bill Campbell was should take out your iPhones and Google him immediately. So, out with the iPhones. Okay, Bill Campbell was the trusted mentor and confidant of Steve Jobs, Tim Cook, Larry Page, Eric Schmidt, Mark Andreessen, Ben Horowitz, Mark Zuckerberg, and countless other tech titans, every one of whom is a name that you know. Bill was arguably the most important person in Silicon Valley who never became a household name, and that was the way he wanted it. 
But here at Columbia, to borrow an idea from Lee Bollinger and tweak it around the edges, Bill Campbell was the beating heart of the Columbia spirit. He was a graduate of Columbia College and Teachers College. He was the co-captain and later the head coach of Columbia's football team. He was the chairman of Columbia's board of trustees. And he was the co-founder and champion of the Columbia Alumni Association, of which you are all now members. Perhaps the keystone of the CAA's accomplishment has been the development of a culture of university citizenship. Bill Campbell embodied this concept better than anyone else, and his example has inspired so many of us to do the same. Established in 2016 and presented each year at graduation, the Campbell Awards recognize one student from each of Columbia's schools who has best exhibited Bill's generosity of spirit, his quality of leadership, and his devotion to university citizenship. This year's Campbell Award winner from the Journalism School is a dual degree student with a concentration in journalism and religion who will also graduate next year from GSAS. She started the Columbia chapter of the Religion, the Religion Newswriters Association and organized events including a panel on covering religion in the age of Trump and a meditation session for students. It gives me great pleasure to present this year's Campbell Award to Emily Churchill. Emily knows, as you should all know, that Bill was a huge hugger. So if you see her for the rest of the day, she's giving him out. Uh, the next award will be presented by Betsy West. And June Cross. <laughs> all right, we're here to present the, um, the DuPont Crichton Award for uh, documentary journalism. Uh, Judy Crichton was a fierce and hard-hitting journalist with a commitment to historical perspectives and compelling storytelling. After a groundbreaking career at ABC and CBS News, where she was one of the first women producers in um, the documentary units, she founded the PBS program, The American Experience. So the uh, DuPont Crichton Award honors uh, student video work in Judy's tradition. Um, those of you who went to DocFest this year know that there were uh, plenty of impressive documentary student films to choose from, from, but there were also a lot of strong entries from around the school. Uh, so one of them, aged out, receives an honorable mention. Lucy Ha followed the stories of vulnerable young people who are kicked out of homeless shelters at the very time when they are most at rich. Risk. Risk. <laughs> Lucy. There we go. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. Um, honorable mention also goes to uh, an investigation um, rigged by Sarah Erickson and Russell Midori. <laughs> rigged is a tough investigation of the construction industry and the unfair labor practices that drive the push to increase affordable housing in New York City. <laughs> Sarah and Russell, okay. can we hang on to, we'll hang on to Russell? Congratulations. And finally, our DuPont Crichton Award winner goes to Daniela Cruzat and Farrah Lopez and their very timely film, Born to Stay. It's the story of Elvia, a star high school student and leader whose classmates have no idea her father's been deported and her mother lives in fear, especially last fall as the election unfolded. Daniela and Farah, come up. And the next award will be presented by the good friend of the school, Mike Kendall. Thank 
Permit me a digression. My own journalism career after or even before J School was as a copy boy at the New York Times 66 years ago last month. And one of my fondest One of my fondest memories was jumping when Meyer Berger yelled copy. I think I'm the only one here who has that distinction. But he was unfailingly uh, pleasant, helpful, and gentle toward even the lowest people in our business. And it, he never changed that. But my special pleasure right now is to present the Philip Greer Memorial Scholarship Award presented for the first time in 1988 for my friend and colleague, Philip Greer. It was established in honor of him, a distinguished financial correspondent and columnist for the New York Herald Tribune, the Washington Post, and ABC News for outstanding financial reporting. There are two awards. The MS winner is Layla Miller, And the MA winner is Micah Maidenberg. Congratulations. I assume that was Layla. And here is Micah. And the next presenter is Layla Woodward. Not Layla, I'm sorry. Tali Woodward. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. Um, the Arthur J. Harris Memorial Prize provides significant funding for an MA graduate to complete an ambitious project upon graduation. This year's prize goes to a proposal to write about forests, landmines, and development in Myanmar. It goes to MA Politics student Ben Graham. Thank you. The next award will be presented by Dean Melanie Huff. So, uh, the Robert Heron Award, which is also known as the Good Guy or Good Gal Award, is presented to the student who has de demonstrated excellence in journalism as well as exemplary courtesy and kindness to fellow students. The award was established in memory of Robert Heron, the former sports writer and longtime assistant to the presidents of this university through gifts from his many friends. Um, to establish who wins this award, we take nominations from the entire uh, journalism school community. Of this year's winner, one nominator wrote, she has been unfailingly kind and generous to so many students this year. When someone in class has a birthday, she bakes a cake. Uh, when somebody is sick, she gets the medicine. Um, and what this nominator wrote is what she finds so extraordinary about this is she does this always smiling and laughing even when I know uh, what is going on in Syria is causing her great pain. <laughs> Another wrote, I admire how she is willing to explain with nuance and tact without alienating others the realities of the, what's happening on the ground in Syria. She seems to strive to find common ground among classmates in every situation and tries to give resources and references for people to learn more. She exemplifies the way we could all try to teach others about our experiences and use each interaction uh, with someone to learn something new. 
So with great pleasure, I give this award to Sarah Dadush. <laughs> And the next presenter is Professor Hancock. Congratulations, Sarah. I had some of those brownies in reporting. <laughs> the Heckinger Prize for Education Reporting is given every year for the best story submitted on the broad subject of education. And this year, I'm pleased to award the prize for a story titled Abstaining from Reality, which is something that sounds pretty good, that takes a new and fresh look at an issue that should be old, but sadly is not, abstinence-based sex education in Texas, a state that has the highest rate of repeat teen pregnancies in the nation. So the story shows that the vast amounts of federal dollars supporting this failed policy will likely not be cut anytime soon. And the writer is Andrea Park. Could I forget the next presenter is our Dean of Academic Affairs, the great Sheila Cornell. Congratulations, everyone. I have the pleasure of presenting the award for outstanding journalism editorial writing to a piece on the, seek, the dark uh, reality, on the dark realities of the fashion industry. Our, our winning piece takes a hard look at the lack of diversity on, in runway models. And she, there she is, and she breaches the, the piece, breach the boundaries of editorial writing by using interviews and photographs to show how black models are stereotyped. They invariably have to look fierce and feral, and yes, congratulations, Nana Aguilar, for your, for your, congratulations, thank you, thank you, can you get a picture, oh, yeah, you got it, sorry, our next award will be presented by Associate Dean Laura Muha. The Peter Keller Prize honors excellence in editing skills. It was created to honor Peter Keller, who spent 56 years at the Wall Street Journal, where he started in the composing room and rose to national news editor. As night editor for more than 25 years, he created one of the highest editing standards in the nation. He trained several generations of reporters and editors who call him the living legend of the journal. And just as an aside, today would have been his 100th birthday. This year's Peter Pr Keller Prize for Excellence in Editing is going to someone whose instructors described her as a godsend for her work on a major special report on Rikers Island for City Newsroom. She also served as photo editor of the City Newsroom site and has helped numerous students get more familiar with video. According to her instructors, this year's winner to mix their metaphor, herds cats like a cowgirl. She's excellent at motivating her colleagues, and the project she oversaw has so many moving parts, print, video, charts, et cetera, that we're not sure it would have come together without her. This year's winner of the Peter Keller Prize for Excellence in Editing goes to Allison Jamie Lau.
And the next award will be presented by Professor Betsy West. So, the Joan Connor Broadcast Journalism Award is presented to the MS student who has produced the most thought-provoking and original television or radio reporting. It was established by Dean Emerita Joan Connor, class of 61, who's had a long and award-winning career as a producer at WNET Channel 13. The winner of this year's Joan Connor Broadcast Journalism Award is Sarah Gibson. Where are you? Our next award will be presented by Professor Sam Friedman. Hey, good morning, enemies of the people. <laughs> Never a better time to be a journalist. The Linton Fellowships in Book Writing, which are funded very generously by the Linton Foundation, are awarded every year to two outstanding students in the book seminar to help them to continue the research and reporting on the books that they've begun in that class. Uh, before going on to this year's winners, I also want to give a uh, recognition to one of last year's winners who's actually walking this year because she's in the part-time program. That was Christine Brown Fisher, who received one of the awards last year for her book in progress about traumatic brain injury. So. You'll probably see Christine tomorrow with her baby bump. Um, as for this year's winners, um, from a very outstanding class, here are the two awardees. A member of the part-time class will be graduating next year for a book about the children left fatherless by the deaths of a parent in each of four wars, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and Iraq, Afghanistan, and she herself the daughter of a Vietnam serviceman who was killed in action 16 hours after her own birth, Mitty Mirror. Don't go away yet. Okay. The second award for a book about the lives of three Somali Americans, one of whom is arrested while trying to go to Syria to fight with ISIS, one of whom becomes a human rights lawyer working extensively against Islamophobia, and one of whom is the journalist who covers the trial of the first and finds himself whipsawed between those in the Somali community who begin to wonder if he could be an informant and those in the Anglo community who think he's probably a terrorist himself. That winner is Mukhtar Ibrahim. <laughs>
Oh man, I'd give it to him every year if I knew that. Uh, our next award is given by Professor Ari Goldman. Professor Melvin Mencher taught at the J School for 28 years until his retirement in 1990. I am proud to say I was one of his students. He was my RW1 professor in the days when we had RW1 and had a great impact on me both as a journalist and as a journalism educator. Mencher was very demanding and exacting and uh, he held his students to a very high standard. He also loved a good fight and often took on deans and administrators and even colleagues. But his students loved him, at least many of us did. And when he retired, his admirers set up a prize to honor great reporting in the Mensher tradition. This year's prize was judged by Professor Helen Benedict and me. We got 15 entries and narrowed the choice down to three. As is my custom, I printed out the three finalists and walked over to Riverside Drive to let Mensher himself decide. Mel is 90. Within a few hours, I got this very surprising email, which I'll share with you. Ari, the three submissions are among the best I have seen, and it was difficult to choose among them. They are excellent examples of public service journalism, a deep school of journalism tradition. It was good to read stories that reflect a journalism of conscience. Also, each relies on multiple sources to document their points, avoiding the bane of too much of today's journalism, the single source story. They also remind me of another principle of Columbia journalism, that good reporting demands that the reporter climb the stairs, knock on doors. Each has repertorial detail specifics that contribute to a generality the need for remedial action. I rated them. Wages unpaid, reuniting families, Bronx community. As I said, a hairline separates them. And I rely on you and Helen to make the final decision. <laughs> you can alter my comments above to fit the submission you select. <laughs> Maybe the three should share the stage. We took his advice. We are going to present the Mensher Award and two runners up. The runners up, I'll, and I'm going to ask them all to come up together so that they all share the stage, as Professor Mensher asked. And the first runner up is Josh Oliver for trying to connect. <laughs> trying to connect one Bronx community struggles to get their neighbors online. That's the first runner up. The second, I'll say the name last so you hear what the story is about. P permanency pending, reuniting families drives New York foster care system, but can leave foster children in limbo. This is a story that has amazing reporting from inside people's homes, takes you into the life of a foster family and, um, and their struggles. And that award goes to Ke'ali Suru. Okay. <laughs> and finally, the winner of this year's Mensher Award goes to Eli Horowitz for Unpaid Wages, Why Workers Can't Collect Their Wages Even After Court Rulings. Um, and we've read stories about restaurant workers not getting paid, and this explores that. But this also writes about the struggles of freelance writers to get paid. It's a very wonderful story. So the winner, again, is Eli Horowitz. And I'll ask the, the three to come up. Hi. That's all right. Hi, Josh. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Well, I'll share the stage with two out of the three. <laughs> uh, thank you. And the next award, the next award will be presented by my colleague, Ann Cooper. The name Henry N. Taylor does not loom large in U.S. journalism today, but it did in the late 1950s when Taylor was a young diplomatic correspondent. He was based in Washington, D.C. for Scripps Howard newspapers, and he was what we call today a parachute artist. He covered international diplomacy. He interviewed Fidel Castro while Castro was still a rebel leader. He reported on the Algerian War for Independence from France and on the espionage trial of American U-2 pilot Francis Gary Powers in Moscow. In 1960, when Henry Taylor was just 31, Scripps Howard sent him from covering the Powers trial in Moscow to newly independent Congo, where Patrice Lumumba was struggling to assert his authority in rebellious parts of the country. Henry Taylor died while covering a battle in that Congo conflict. And every year we honor his memory with the Henry N. Taylor Award, um, which carries a travel grant with it, and goes to the top international student in the MS program. Now, a third of our MS student body this year came from outside the US, actually from 34 different countries, literally from around the world. Um, and the student we honor this year has two nationalities, neither of them U.S. One professor says this student is intellectually curious, journalistically rigorous, and creative. Another says serious, fastidious, and hardworking, and adds that this student wrote with depth and authority on Latino literature and English translation, among other subjects. I'm pleased to present this award to the 2017 top international MS student, Diego Corte. And the next award is presented by my colleague, Michael Shapiro. And the Oscar goes to La La Land. <laughs> Oops. Um, if I may be permitted a personal note, um, this is the first journalism day that I can recall, and I suspect everybody, my, my colleagues can recall, that David Claytel is not here. And um, if David were here, David Claytel, for those of you who did not know him, because he sadly died just before the school year began, um, was a professor, the acting dean, the he David just did everything like forever. And were David here, he'd be sitting off in the corner, um, grousing about the number of awards we give out. And then, and then afterwards, outside, because every one of the award winners would say, Professor Claytel, can I have my picture taken with you? And he would have done it. Because <laughs> he was a great guy, and we miss him. Um, I am. <clears throat> I am charged with giving the, presenting three awards, the James A. Wexler Memorial Awards were established by the Pisces Foundation. <laughs> you didn't know that, but they were. By the Pisces Foundation in memory of the former editor and columnist of the New York Post. Now, hold it for a second, because you're thinking the New York Post about a headless body and topless bar award. I don't get this. There was a time, there was a time where the New York Post was a great liberal tabloid. I kid you not. And James Wexler was a columnist in the editorial page editor. And, oh, God, he would have just loved being a columnist now. So we give three Wexler Awards. We give it for local, international, and national. 
For the international award, the award goes for an insightful examination of Turkey's decision to abandon its role as a regional power in the Syrian civil war so that it can continue its long-standing battle against the Kurds. And that award goes to Joseph Flaherty. The next award goes for national reporting and is for a powerful and evocative story about the ongoing debate over assisted suicide. And the winner is Sylvia Barnum O'Regan. And finally, for local reporting, for a story about the deafening perils, to say nothing of the cost, of living in the flight path to LaGuardia Airport. And that goes to Bruno Gallo. Congratulations. The next award will be presented by my colleague, Ronnie Isabel. Thank you. I'm pleased to uh, present today the Lewis Wittick Prize, which is endowed by the Wittick, Wittick family and given to the best story about New York City. Uh, this year's winner uh, wrote a piece that looked really deeply into a day in the life of Bronx Housing Court. The winner is Emily Albrecht. Okay, we're almost done. That is a lot of awards, but there are actually, in fact, a lot of you. Um, if you, uh, I mean, if you add up the full-time MS class that many of you are part of, and the part-time and the MA program, you're pretty close to 300 students. And uh, each year, we we also award honors. Unfortunately, for the MA students, only within the MS program, so full-time and part-time. And this is something that. Uh, recognizes outstanding work over the whole course of the year. Because as you know, in your seminars, if you're in a group of 15 or 16, two students in each credit-based seminar is awarded honors um, at the professor's discretion. In smaller seminars, it might be one student. And so you, uh, those points accumulate over the year. And then the top 10% of the class is recognized with honors. And then the four highest performing students are awarded the Pulitzer Fellowships, which are substantial traveling fellowships that you can use after school to go, go uh, chase your story wherever it may be. And so it's really fun to read out the honors winners. Um, we're going to do this again tomorrow in front of your parents um, <laughs> and your friends, uh, but I would want to recognize you now and let you know uh, who, who the honors winners are this year. So maybe stand up when I call, call your name, and uh, then we'll recognize everybody at the end. Um, first, John Alsop. <laughs> you can remain standing, please. Please, please remain standing. Yeah, it'll be a while, but uh, not too long. Manuela Andrioni. Uh, Grace Saffron Ashford.
Uh, Kate, Kate Koff. The previously mentioned Diego Corchet. Nick Diaz. Nicole Einbinder. The previously introduced Sarah Erickson. Joseph August Basu Finelli. Previous honoree, Joseph Flaherty. <laughs> Emma Freer. <laughs> Natasha Frost. Sarah Gibson. Mika Hauser. Camila Kerwin. Avi Lieber. <laughs> Hannah Ruth Long Higgins. <laughs> Megan Morelli. Sean McGowan. <laughs> Angeli Nyer. <laughs> Joshua Charles Kelsol Oliver. Thomas Piccolo. <laughs> Dylan Shen. <laughs> Alicia Steindecker. Priscilla Thompson. And finally, Courtney Vinopal. So uh, congratulations to all of you. We're really proud of your hard work, outstanding work. Grateful for your diligence. All right, and from that group now come the Pulitzer Traveling Fellowship winners, which um, include one special award for um, a student with a special interest in arts and art criticism, and that fellowship goes to MA student Min Chen. Please come on up. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. Good luck. 
All right, and now the four fellowships for the top four students in the graduating MS class, uh, full-time and part-time. The first of these goes to John Alsop. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. There we go. Use it in good health. Uh, the next award goes to a part-time colleague who graduated at a different cycle last year and is on a shoot with Vice. But you should know that Ar Oliver Arnaldi won uh, one of the top four classes. And the next fellowship goes to Nicole Einbinder. Please come up. Very impressive. <laughs> Slow walk to glory. <laughs> And finally, the number one student in the graduating class, your valedictorian, don't hold it against him, Joseph Flaherty. Congratulations. Well done. 